Good morning. Welcome to this Resolution Foundation event, New Age or Age Old Appeal. And one of the biggest changes in political and voting behaviour in Britain over the last 30 or 40 years has been the decreasing significance of social class and the increasing significance of age. And what we're going to do today with three experts is identify exactly where these trends are today and what this means in prospects for the forthcoming election. Uh, we'll hear first of all from Sophie Hale, Principal Economist here at Resolution Foundation, who's going to present the findings from our research out this morning. Uh, and then we'll hear from uh, James Canagasorium and also from Lara Spirit, who I'll introduce individually in a moment. But Sophie, over to you. Um, thanks, David. Uh, so today, as David says, I'm going to take us through the findings from our latest report. Um, it is looking at how uh, reported voting intentions have changed um, with an intergenerational lens, um, specifically focusing on how things look different since the 2019 election um, as we kind of enter an election year this year. I'd like to thank my uh, co-author, big thanks to Cameron there, um, uh, for all of his um, input into this project, and also our partners in the ESRC Connecting Generations Research Programme for their input. Um, so why should we have an intergenerational lens when we're thinking about um, elections um, and kind of voting intentions? Um, well, uh, to steal a quote from, uh, from, from David, Pizza Polzer, the political scientist, wrote that class is the basis of, of British party politics and all else is embellishment and detail. Um, but in the general elections in 2017 and 2019, instead what we've seen is a sort of crystallisation of a trend that has been building over this century and that is age becoming the central fault line of British politics, not income or class. In fact, if we rewind 30 years, as you can see in this chart, age really wasn't a key a determiner of party preference um, in the same way that it is today. In 1992, those in their 70s were just 12% more likely to vote Conservative than those in their 30s. Um, and by 2019, that's changed substantially. You can see that by the sort of trend line becoming a lot more steep in the 2019 election. Um, and now, those in their 70s are more than twice as likely to vote Conservative as those in their 30s. And on the other hand, what we've seen is income becoming a much less important determinator in the same period. Again, if you look at the kind of two bottom charts, um, the line has become a lot less steep. So age um, has really kind of replaced income as a key predictor of party preference. Um, in fact, in 2019, income alone was really not a, not a predictor at all of whether someone voted Conservative. And all of these trends are kind of true in the reverse for Labour as well. Um, but it's not just who we vote for, um, it's also whether we vote at all that's uh, strongly correlated with our age. Um, and uh, as we can see here, up to the 1997 election, there was actually um, relatively small gaps in voter turnout um, between age groups, um, and so between the younger and older voters. But by 2017, those age gaps had really kind of increased and peaked. Um, at really kind of high levels with those aged 65 and over 35 percentage points more likely um, to turn out and vote than those aged 25 and 34. And even in 2019 election, we still see a really, really wide and substantial um, age uh, turnout gap. And so clearly age has become a really important issue for us to think about when we're thinking about um, uh, voting intentions, about voting behavior, about general elections. Um, but those weren't really normal elections, the 2017 and 2019 elections. Um, Brexit loomed large and that was a, a, an issue with incredibly age divided views on it. And so in this report, what we've done is um, we've kind of set out to look at, well, how things have changed since 2019 and, and look at kind of the intergenerational shifts um, that have occurred since that last general election. To do this, we mainly drew on the British Election Survey panel data, and um, this gives us a really kind of big sample, much bigger than other kind of polling data, um, and that allows us to look within generations and look at kind of more detailed trends. 
The downside is that the, the, the latest wave is sort of May 2023. Um, and, and, you know, that is obviously um, a few months ago. Um, but when we look at the kind of bigger picture intergenerational trends in the polls um, that are kind of comparable, um, we see that things haven't really changed that much um, over this period. So, we, so we'd still think these are kind of um, interesting results to be looking at. So first of all, there's been a substantial shift in the kind of policy landscape and in electorate's um, priorities um, in since 2019 um, and electorate's priorities have shifted from this highly age divided issue um, Brexit uh, to a much more uh, to an issue where there's much more alignment across age groups the economy um, and you can see here Europe kind of really collapsing as a priority issue since 2019 um, but you can also see that more than 50% of all generations um, on the kind of left hand side are prioritizing the economy as their top policy issue um, so for those of us that are hoping for a little bit more political intergenerational harmony, this is quite a good sign. Uh, maybe we'll have an election that is characterised by a little bit less um, of the kind of typical age divided sort of policy debates um, that we've seen in recent elections. Um, and for example, on the economy, views are actually even within that kind of area in many ways quite aligned between age groups. So there was recent polling that came out that was looking at um, you know, views on public spending versus tax cuts. And again, between age groups, we actually see uh, a lot of similarity in the views that were kind of put forward. Um, however, the one other thing, the one other kind of policy area that we see ticking up here um, in ticking up in kind of political salience recently is immigration, um, as you can see on the right hand side. And that is a highly age divided issue. And in fact, um, when we look at polls that look more recently than May 2023, we see that immigration has continued to tick up as a kind of top um, priority issue for voters, um, while the economy has been coming down, um, you know, maybe naturally, as we've seen things like inflation kind of falling down as well. In October 2022, 21% had it as one of their kind of top policy issues. Um, and by January 2024, this was up at 39%, almost doubling over that period. Immigration is highly age divided um, with very different views um, uh, towards it from older and younger voters. However, over this period, we have seen the views towards immigration becoming more negative across generations. So while silent generation voters think the country, so while, sorry, seven percentage points more of the silent generation voters think that we should be having fewer immigrants into the country, um, since 2019, uh, we also have seen this increase by four percentage points for millennials, so younger and older voters alike. We've clearly seen the main political parties kind of uh, responding to this uh, this uptick in kind of interest and focus on immigration, um, and we've also seen reform um, the reform party kind of ticking up in the polls, um, up from two percent in May 2023 to ten percent. So it is possible that we see immigration, um, a highly age divided issue, kind of moving into centre politics as we um, as we kind of uh, move our way through this um, election year. The other big trend that I'm sure hasn't kind of passed anyone by um, here is that uh, Labour have been doing better in the polls. Um, what we can see is that Labour have actually been doing better across all generations and um, there has been a swing towards Labour. But when we look within generations, there is one group um, in particular that is bucking this trend, and that is the less well-off um, sort of younger voters. Um, specifically, this chart shows that millennial non-graduates and non-homeowners were reporting being no more likely to vote Labour um, in this election, um, in the coming election um, in May 2023 than they were in 2019, which, as we know, was a kind of conservative landslide victory. Um, uh, as an election. Interestingly, this is happening despite the fact that these groups are still reporting being less likely to vote Conservative. So what's going on? Well, ultimately, this is a turnout story. So um, non-graduates and non-homeowner millennials are all reporting that they are less likely to vote at all um, in the coming election, um, with the share reporting they are likely to vote down 8 percentage points and 12 percentage points respectively, as you can see here. Um, and this could potentially widen what are already really substantial education and home ownership gaps in younger gener in turnout gaps um, amongst the younger generation. And we should be worried about this for a couple of reasons. First, the kind of voting behavior that we have when we're younger can become embedded. So this could be setting out kind of lifetime voting behavior um, for, these, um, for these groups um, with knock-on impacts on their likelihood to vote in future elections. But 
perhaps even more importantly, we should be worried about this because those who are less likely to vote are much less likely to see their policy priorities being the priorities of parties that are looking to win elections. And the UK may be, and in the UK that is increasingly becoming younger, less well-off voters. And so where does this leave us as we kind of enter the uh, 2024 election year? Well, what we would probably have expected to see um, is that millennials should be gaining ground on the boomers as a kind of voting block. So the baby boomer voting block has shrunk has shrunk relative to the millennials between 2019 um, and the next election. And that's in part because of a higher death rate, um, etc. So what we should have seen is them kind of becoming relatively more important as a voting block. So have we seen that? Well, if we look just at the, the proportion that are saying they're likely to vote and compare the how much of the people that are reporting being likely to vote account for um, are baby boomers versus millennials. Um, what we see is the opposite. So because of these growing turnout gaps within millennials, um, overall as the millennial generation is, no, is reporting being no more likely to turn out and vote than they were in 2019, uh, the baby boomer generation has instead seen that kind of um, reported likelihood to vote increase. And so what we see here is that um, uh, in the next election, instead of gaining ground, the millennials may in fact um, see the turnout advantage of baby boomers over millennials increasing rather than shrinking. Um, and this is despite, you know, millennials getting older where we would expect them to kind of be seeing their turnout increasing rather than decreasing. So to summarize our kind of key five findings of kind of intergenerational trends, first, um, the policy priorities have shifted and they've shifted from a more kind of age divided policy um, set of policy issues to basically Brexit and um, to, to something with, which is a bit less age divided, the economy. Um, immigration is, I guess, the sort of wild card here. Um, it is a highly age divided issue and views have become more negative across generations. But this could really kind of bring back in that like age dynamic into kind of the key policy focus. Um, less well-off younger voters, um, particularly non-graduates and non-homeowners, were no more like are reporting being no more likely to vote Labour than they were in 2019, and they're the only group that kind of sits in that when we um, in the chart we showed earlier. And this is basically because the turnout gap for um, the education and home ownership turnout gap for millennials is set to widen um, in this election based on uh, on kind of reported um, voting intentions. And finally, the baby boomer um, turnout advantage may widen um, rather than narrow as they kind of continue to outvote younger generations at the next election. Thank That's you it. very much indeed. Thank you, Sophie. Um, some really uh, important points there. And just to add one more fact to, to reinforce that final observation about turnout. What, uh, and of course, you've both got some really big cohorts amongst the boomers, and you've also got high rates of uh, electoral registration. So just for people on the electoral register at the next election, we estimate there will be 700,000 people aged 60. 700,000 60-year-olds on the register and with quite a high propensity to vote, we think there will be 570,000 30-year-olds on the register, probably also with a slightly lower propensity to vote. So the, the size of these uh, boomer voting cohorts is really quite significant and reinforced by their higher likelihood of being in the kind of environment owning their own home where they're very likely to be on the register and then perhaps even so with a further advantage of being high propensity to turn out. So this really does help shape the electoral calculations for individual parties. And someone who's an expert on that is James Kanigasorian. He was, uh, is on the advisory board at Onward. Uh, he famously coined the concept of the Red Wall. He's now Chief Research Officer at Focal Data. James, thank you very much for joining us. Over to you. Thanks, David. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I'll try and be brief and kind of do a semi-response, semi I think, uh, um, in terms of the polling, which was really, really interesting. So in terms of the age curve and uh, what's happening and where we're likely to go in the future, um, I'll just turn my chair slightly here. So I'm, not, I'm not talking to one corner of the room that has no people in. Um, there's a couple of interesting things going on as to why younger people are uh, so much more 
pro-Labour uh, and pro-progressive parties and older people tend to be more conservative. And I think there's basically six things have coalesced over the last 20 years to create basically a perfect storm for an age curve. I think basically it's, it's demographics, it's social values, economic values, Brexit, the economic incentives and geography. And, and, and I would call them, so I'm producing a piece of work at the weekend uh, uh, for the FT with John Byrne Murdoch uh, called about weather veins. And basically for younger people, all the weather veins are pointing the same direction. Um, and what that does is that creates a massive compound effect. So for example, let's take demographics. We talked a lot about younger people becoming, uh, as they get older, uh, more conservative and younger people being much more left-wing. A lot of that is a consequence of other confounds. And the first confound is, is higher education. I don't need to uh, lecture Lord Willits on higher education. He's the guru on that. But functionally, once you adjust for levels of education, a lot of the age curve that we see is a function of the fact that a lot of boomers have not gone to university and a lot of millennials and Gen Zs uh, have. And the second, if you think about the other key demographic markers that are being wrapped into that, you've got things like car usage, home ownership, uh, and uh, where, you know, where people live. And once you do that, once you adjust for all those factors, actually, the age curve is much less steep. In other words, younger people are literally different as opposed to just the fact that they're young. They have lead completely different lifestyles, completely different demographic markers. And you know, that's the first thing that's happened. And all of those have become more skewed on an age basis. That's the thing, right? Home ownership has become more skewed on an age basis. Um, and the other thing is marital status, which is very kind of strongly correlated to whether you're centre right or centre left. Um, on top of that, if that wasn't enough, there are another five reasons. So the second is like social values. So if you think, what do we mean by social values? We mean things like attitudes towards immigration, uh, kind of uh, equality, representation, uh, attitudes towards diversity, towards history. That's, they skew very sharply on an age curve and an education curve. And that kind of creates a bit of a mood music behind uh, the brands of each party in centre-left and centre-right. Then on top of that, you layer economic values. There's very strong evidence that on a number of different issues, people who are younger sit much further to the left on how they would imagine the size of the state, what they expect on public services, the rate of tax that they expect to pay. So again, already a bit of a perfect storm. And then you've got another three things coming on top of that. Um, I'm sure uh, Lara will speak to, to Brexit in, in more detail, but then you've got... Uh, this, this huge fissure that was on a very, very sharp curve, Brexit, which became a proxy for all sorts of other things. And one of the things that I've noticed is that when you poll Brexit, which is now a rejoin versus stay out question, you know, there is a, there is a, a decent majority for rejoin. But even once you've adjusted for the likely terms of rejoining, which would be things like Schengen, we don't know whether there'll be issues around the euro, we don't know, understand that the conditions would be completely different. What's really interesting is the split basically returns. But younger people are still up for rejoining on a completely different uh, kind of basis. Again, reasserting the Brexit divide. And then on top of that, you've got incentives. In other words, the share of wealth in the country and the way that people feel uh, for younger people versus older. And then the most interesting one, which is geography. One of the big things that happened with the expansion of higher education is that it turned into a, a sorting hat for the UK based on age. So basically huge proportions of the UK got substantially older uh, than they were uh, and huge proportions of the, which tend to be more rural areas tend to be areas that are with lower levels of connectivity and then certain areas particularly in cities but more acutely in university-based cities or, t or towns or areas where there is kind of growth in industry saw a much younger uh, group of people coming in and so actually the actual areas that we're talking about here are just completely different. So the Sedgefield that Tony Blair won as Prime Minister is a completely different constituency to the, to the constituency that his election agent Phil, Phil Wilson lost in 2019. So we're not really talking about like for like. So that would be my reflections, and this all sounds pretty structural, and that's because it is, but because I think the education divide is the real story behind uh, the age curve in politics, I do think it's going to lessen the age curve over time. There's a couple of reasons for that. We can see that from other international comparisons. So, you know, Sophie will study Thomas Piketty. I'm sure he's the centre-left economist who focused on uh, kind of inequality. One of the really interesting things that he found out was uh, he, he, his idea of politics was, yes, it's realigned from class, and by class he meant income, and that's correct. But what he actually pointed out is that what we should really be looking at 
is the amount of income that someone has for their level of education. In other words, a ratio of how, worth, how wealthy are you for the amount of education that you've had. And what he came up with broadly is that as soon as you look at that ratio, that describes the left and the right quite efficiently. So he talked about the Brahmin left, which was like very over, like hyper-educated people with no money, being the people most likely to be left-wing. And he talked about the merchant right. In other words, people who were much older with very low levels of education who had made a lot of money. And then everyone else in between are the new swing voters. And that's really the story. And then an interesting addendum to that, we talk about the age curve, and that's predominantly true for most people in the UK. What's really interesting is if you're a minority, the age curve operates in a very, very different way. It doesn't really operate like we've described here in aggregate, and that's because 85% of people in the country are white, so obviously the polling will reflect that. Um, but what's really interesting there is that uh, it's a lot more fractured. You see a lot of, particularly in certain communities, older voters being uh, much further to the left than the younger communities. And that's principally because minorities vote on a classical uh, centre-left, centre-right axis, uh, which means that the age curve lessens. And I guess the last thing I would say is on international picture, which is that everywhere across the English-speaking world, the age curve is beginning to lessen. So. If you look at the polling in the States and you look at what, what's happening and why Donald Trump is still competitive, he's basically winning over uh, uh, some of the highest numbers that have ever been seen for a Republican candidate amongst millennials and Gen Z. And when you look even further, the people who's winning over are young black men and Hispanics. Um, and what that's part of is, again, an education and, cl and class dealignment. The same is also true in Canada. If you look at cross breaks of what's going to happen at a potential election, Pierre Polivier, who's the uh, centre-right leader there, is likely to win power on a greater share of young people's votes than older. So if you go to Canada and you talk to an older person, odds on are that they have a much greater history of voting for left-wing parties uh, than if you talk to a young person. So I think when we think about the UK context of all of this, and the same is true also of Le Pen and Macron and the dynamics in uh, France, and then there's a very different story in Germany. So actually when you look at the UK situation, it is really, really unique. And my view is the reason it's unique is because all of our weather vanes point in the same direction, whereas they don't in other countries. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, James. Um, I have to say, and it's very interesting, the, the, the weight that James attaches to higher education. And I must say, I'm completely torn on this. On the one hand, I actually think more people going to higher education is is basically if they want to do it and they can get through is a good thing, good thing for them, good thing for the economy. A lot of my Tory friends, however, say that this is just a mechanism for producing Labour voters and they will be, and they're like kind of moody rebels in a Dostoevsky novel who, who've got a degree and of course, although their earnings may be reasonable, they, they're, they're getting onto the property ladder and ownership is very tough for them. So in reality, this is bad news for conservatives. And the, the one comment I would make, and I'm, so I try to reconcile these tensions, and if you look at the attitudes of graduates, um, they are by and large part, uh, and it's not just sorting, it's probably also part of the effect just of going to university, they're uh, more likely to uh, volunteer, they're quite, uh, they're more tolerant, they're quite socially engaged, they're also quite skeptical of the state, they're, they're quite liberal-minded on, on uh, uh, and if anything, distrustful of the state. So when you look at the values of young people, they are not automatically impossible for a certain sort of Conservative Party to reach out to. They are not, um, and, I, and you observed in my visits to university, they're not Marxist revolutionaries. These are, these are people who are, I would say, winnable for a, if a political party from the centre-right as much as on the centre left, actually made an effort to try to win them over. But I see James now wants to mark my homework. I'm going to get a response. <laughs> the definitive study on whether university makes you left wing was published by Dr. Elizabeth Simon, which came out last, last year. And she's at Queen Mary and she's actually an ex-colleague of mine. And it's a stunning study because it's basically a study of, ident of identical siblings, uh, twins. And what she worked out via confounds and like a pretty, pretty complex and very, very robust peer-reviewed paper is basically that university does make you a little bit more left-wing, the experience, but actually it's the, it's the choice mechanism. And they can literally do that because they have twins who grow up in the same. Yeah. And they can see that the, correlate, the strongest correlates are basically personality. And so the choice to go to university is a personality-based decision. And then what you're having is a self-sorting mechanism where 
different bits of the country have different personality characteristics, which sounds like a great idea for unity. Mm. Uh, <laughs> Very interesting. Now, I should have said, by the way, earlier to our, all our online participants, and some of you are already doing this, of course, do go to the Slido page on our website if you want to either put down your own question or equally upvote a particular question that you attach great weight for. And now it's wonderful that we've got Laura Spirit, who, of course, edits the Times Red Box, gives us the essential analysis first thing in the morning of the political stories of the day and what to look out for. Thank you very much for joining us. We realise it must be quite late in the day for you already, <laughs> as we now understand you get up at four o'clock in the morning to write this. <laughs> so thank you for keeping on going. And uh, over to you. Thank you. Um, I guess listening to this, the thing that I'm thinking about is how this will play out in the next election. But actually, also more interestingly, after the next election, I think this will become um, an even more interesting question. On the next election, I think the signs are quite clear looking at Sophie's um, research that immigration is going to be something that the Conservatives want to lean into, yeah. whether or not that's, they want to lean into that because um, they've made the active choice to do that or because basically they now have to do that, given how totemic, for example, the Rwanda scheme uh, and the foray over that has become, I think, is another question. But I think looking at that data, it's quite clear that uh, they see in immigration uh, an opportunity or at the very least they see um, a danger of losing more of the people that they are already worried about losing should they not be seen as more competent uh, or as coming good on the promises that they've made on that. So I think that for me makes the next election less interesting in terms of young people. One pledge I think that does divide the two parties, and there aren't that many things that necessarily do in policy uh, terms currently, is on housing. I think you will see that in the next election. You will see the fact that Keir Starmer is promising to build and build big on the Green Belt and that Rishi Sunak is uh, very firmly opposed to that and openly so and seems to want to have that fight as something that we will see. And that is implicitly quite a generational question, even if it's not something that necessarily divides generations. And one of the most interesting things about that research is on how on the economy we tend to be quite united across uh, generations. But I think actually after the next election, this question of where young people go, and it was fascinating listening to James on the weather vane indications of that, uh, I think the Conservatives do need to find a way to appeal to younger voters. That much is obviously uh, clear. And there are some opportunities in this uh, literature for how they might be able to do that. And I don't think they will uh, give up on that quite so much. I think it's an interesting, I would love to ask James about this, but there is this kind of debate about whether or not among young people there's a kind of anti-incumbency streak, this idea that, you know, Thatcher maybe did quite well in 79 with young voters, that Cameron maybe did quite well in 2010 with young voters, this idea that they are actually uh, more win that you could win them back and should Keir Starmer uh, win the next election as the polls predict whether or not there is then an opportunity uh, if he's losing votes, say, to the left, to the Greens, if he doesn't come good on some of those promises on, say, housing, uh, for the Conservatives to make some headway on that. And I wonder what you think about that. Sorry, I know I'm supposed to be giving a presentation, <laughs> but I just found myself listening to James and being struck by wanting to ask whether he thinks that is that is an inevitable thing. Because reading the research, it'll be great to see what you've done with John this weekend, but reading what he's done on this topic before, it strikes me that there does seem to be a sense of demography as destiny in that question that something fundamental is happening that means that this is something that maybe, you know, certain policies from the Conservatives won't be able to wrest back young voters from. And I think there is a separate strand of thought that says actually it's not destiny and should the Conservatives provide a viable platform and obviously Onward would argue this is quite similar right they're keen on on arguing that the young vote isn't lost to the Conservatives yeah. Yeah. and that's not a, a kind of you know thing that we should just take as read obviously at some point it becomes an existential question for the Conservative Party um, but I wonder what you think about that and I hope it's okay to ask James to yeah, well, it's an innovation <laughs> at our resolution events but go for it one um, <laughs> David uh, give, uh, have a quick comment James and then we'll resume uh, briefly with Laura I think um, I would never say demographics are destiny otherwise we'd have the same election result every every time uh, demographics are propensity which is less catchy and um, so it, 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 the, the order in which people are likely or not likely to do something is driven by demographics but whether they actually go and do it is a function of events and stuff in terms of the question over young people, uh, one of the things we can kind of maybe talk about as a group is that really the propensity to be right wing uh, is not really a curve in this country. It's more of a Nike tech. Um, and actually, um, there's a big difference between uh, the youngest group of people who are 18 to yeah. 24 and actually people who are kind of, yeah. 
I say my age, I've just fallen out of that bucket. People, <laughs> people who are 25, I always just up the bucket, so I'm in it. But people who are basically 25 to 34, um, who are structurally much more left-wing than the newest group of voters. Uh, and that has been quite consistent. And there are cohort effects, like groups of people are structurally different. And if you look at an average, it's not that clear, but if you really delve in, you can see that people who are 25 to 34 are centre-left shock troopers. Uh, and that people who are uh, the generation below, uh, 18 to 24, particularly actually if you're, if you're male, this is, you know, got almost double digit more uh, center right than they are of the cohort above them. Um, so I think things are gonna get messier. Um, and I think the political cycle is a political cycle. That's the thing, you know, uh, there's, a, there's an incumbency thing, parties do get elected and then they get kicked out. And that can hide another story. But my instinct is that the education divide will reassert itself amongst young people, particularly as like t uh, apprenticeships, T levels start to come in. And you might start to see uh, the younger vote fracture uh, in a much more diverse way, uh, both to the left and the Greens. I think the Greens are going to be in a very interesting space after the election. Now, we, we must get back to Laura. You were so, so courteous of you. But is there anything <laughs> you'd like to add on your own behalf uh, before um, we turn out to the wider question? Anything just else? it's an enduring curiosity to me um, how there is such a lack of anger at, from young people um, mm. and a sense of generational solidarity in spite of the structural conditions that work against them. Whether or not that change, I think, will change, I think, uh, will be very... Interesting, I used to think um, that Brexit could represent a kind of permanent chasm between generations, not just that, but that it could kind of build in a kind of permanent apathy as well. I think what's worrying about the findings is that there does seem to be indication of an apathy that could become permanent. I think what's encouraging in many ways is that that's not determined by Brexit, it's determined by issues that all generations care about. So I think that's yeah. what I've taken from today. Thank you very much. And of course, also, Laura, let's also thank you for the important point that part of political conflict, challenge, uh, competition in the election is on the relative salience of issues. And I think um, part of the battle is to who gets their issues to be most salient. And you're reminding us there's a reason why Conservatives might wish to make immigration more salient, yeah. and there's a reason why Labour might wish, wish make housing more salient, and who wins that tussle itself is an important political challenge. But thank you very much indeed. Um, now, it's, we've got, I have to say, there's one question online which has been upvoted uh, more than all the others. So I think we ought to just start with that. Um, and it's about the rise in disinformation and misinformation and social media. And to what extent has this had a differential effect on different generations uh, in their voting habits? So if we don't really cover that. Is there anything you want to say on that? Uh, no, I mean, it's not really something we've looked at uh, yeah. in a lot of detail, but these guys have more to say. Would you, any observations well, on that? <clears throat> there's been some quite interesting research um, from James's colleague that we've mentioned a number of times, uh, John Bazmerka at the FT, about gender divides, especially among young people and how young women have become more liberal, young men are becoming more uh, conservative, and this question about whether or not that has something to do with the social media platforms they use. Are young men more on YouTube, for example? Are young women more on TikTok, for example? Uh, but I'm not an expert in that, and again, defer to James to see if there's something to add. Right. <laughs> James? I think you can hear me. Um, no, I don't have anything particular. I mean, there's a lot clustered in that question. Um, social media is obviously important, but it is important to every generation. And I think, yeah, you get smaller circles of influence. So fragmentation is probably likely. And uh, nothing to add on than what Lara mentioned. Right. OK. Now, we are just uh, I'm going to put out a poll question for people to vote. And uh, while people are deciding how to vote, I'm going to take a question or two from our audience here. But we always like asking people a a polling question and the uh, this is a multiple choice question very simple though will do you think the age divide in voters political party preferences will rise or fall is is age going to become more salient or next salient, less salient in the next election and while our online participants and anybody else here who's online are voting on that we let's take a cup of some interventions 
Uh, and we have a roving mic. Let's have a couple from the, uh, here from the passageway, the lady in blue and the guy at the front. Yep. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I'm Grace Duffy from Bridges Outcomes Partnerships. Uh, we work with vulnerable and, and underserved communities uh, across the country, and it's clear from a lot of our work that actually the kind of traditional model of public services is, is failing a, a sort of large number of people. So I'd really like to get the panel's view on whether they feel that the sort of change in the extent and provision of public services over sort of recent decades is, is feeding into either likelihood to vote or the party that, um, that different demographics are likely to vote for. Right, thank you. Public services question. Yes, and here at the front. Thank you. Uh, my name's Martin Lejeune. I work for a campaign called Age Irrelevance which is trying to ensure we have society to work, which works for all generations. Um, and I want to invite the panel, and it was a great panel, by the way, thank you all, um, to comment on whether we should blame political parties for this. Their retail offer is becoming ever more sophisticated, very more targeted, obsessed, I certainly think in the Conservative case, by what is called the core vote. So they are, they are driving splinters into a society which, um, in a better political setup, might create, uh, uh, might create more unity. So are the political parties, to a certain extent, to blame for what we have now? Right. Are the parties to blame? And also, just as an extra point for our panellists to comment on, um, and, uh, which is the results from our polling, just to show how people... There's a majority that think that um, age is going to be a more salient divide in the next election, 54%, and 29% think it's going to fall, some 17% say it's going to stay the same. That's interesting, a belief that this trend is going to become more salient. James, do you want to comment on those two questions about public services and also political parties driving the divide and perhaps an observation on this finding as well? Three quite hard questions, so mm, yeah. <laughs> thanks. Um, on the question on uh, public services, there's, I think, something that's really interesting that's gone on, uh, which is that for years, um, if you take the British Social Attitude Survey, which is like a gold standard survey that's produced every year to measure really fundamental attitudes that aren't to do with voting intention, and it's what academics use. And what's really interesting is that people's views about the size of the state, and you're given like three options, you know, should taxes go up or should they stay the same or should they be reduced? And the same is asked also of the size of the state. That moves in lockstep with the percentage of spending, uh, the amount of spending is a percentage of GDP. Uh, and it's like homeostasis, it's kind of like magic. They move, there's a small lag, but basically they're perfectly correlated, except until now, for the last three years. Um, and something's happened, which is basically state spending as a percent of GDP has gone up substantially. Tax burden is very, very high. But uh, the numbers of people who want to reduce the size of the state has not um, gone up concurrently. In other words, that, that tracking process has fallen away. And I think the reason for that is effectively what people see in terms of public services. So people don't feel like public services are like being over-invested in which was the case, by the way, in, in 2007, 2008, 2009, when you looked at the polling, that was the mood music behind kind of David Cameron's opposition. A lot of people were saying spending seems pretty high. And you know, people are really very clever and they have a very, very good sense of what's happening. And what's really interesting is clearly the money that is being spent is not resulting in a concurrent rise in levels of public services. And there's all sorts of reasons for that uh, from left and right, how is it spent? what's happening on a managerial level, what's happening on the productivity crisis. So that's, that would be my answer to that. And the second question to do with unity, I, I just don't think there's ever been unity. I mean, 1997 was not a unified moment. You know, Tony Blair won fewer votes than John Major did in 1992 on falling turnout, mm -hmm. right? Um, and only led by 12.5% and won fewer votes than Theresa May. And in 2019, when Boris Johnson won, the country was also massively split and actually Labour had a surprisingly high vote share. Actually, if you go back to 2019, it was north of 32%. Mm. So I would argue politics has always been divided. It has always been a competition for values, for visions. Uh, unity is, is nice. People talk about the 2012 Olympics and other such things, uh, but I'm very skeptical that that has ever existed at any point in time. Um, on the, sorry if that felt, uh, but, but, and, I, and on the third question, age divide, I think, uh, I don't know, how, it's not a proper poll, first thing to note, 
as a poster. <laughs> Are you saying that people who participate, <laughs> not, participate not, in not, 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 not being weighted, <laughs> but um, um, it's, it's going to fall. So um, the results are so saying they're wrong. The results are wrong. Right, you're wrong. Um, and because of Sophie's numbers, if you go yep. back to the seventh, yep. if you go back to the seventh yep. slide, <laughs> the greatest amount of fall in vote share for the Conservatives has come amongst uh, boomers and older people. So if you back out that mathematics, that means that the average crossover age is lowered. Yep. So Theresa May had less of an age curve in 2017 than Boris Johnson did, mm -hmm. even though she won fewer votes. Yeah. So that's that's the technical yeah. answer. The Brexit effect is very was very powerful. Um, your observations on those points, Laura? Um, <coughs> sorry, I don't have a huge amount to add other than that it's curious um, looking at that and Sophie's research and various contributions, how different the debate and the framing of all of this is in Westminster, where you don't have a Labour Party that's saying, in spite of what James has just said, yes, we're going to pour money into public services, yes, we're going to make spending commitments. In fact, what you have is a very protracted um, period in which we're seeing Labour row back or try and dilute their uh, 28 billion pledge, I think still in spite of what Keir Starmer said yesterday about um, it being desperately needed. Um, so that I think is quite, is quite interesting and that despite uh, voters seemingly not prioritising tax cuts over more money for public services, that is nonetheless the framing that the Conservative Party want to have in this debate going forward and I can't see that changing ahead of the election, certainly not after the spring budget. So I, that's, I find those... Yeah. Those points curious. Thank you. Sophie? Uh, yeah, a couple of things um, I wanted to add. So, I mean, I think, first of all, talking about the kind of divide and, and the political issues, one thing that we haven't talked about that we did look at when we were doing this research is environment. And, and you mentioned, James, the like role that the Green Party might kind of play um, moving forward. Um, and, you know, I mean, clearly the net zero um, transition is going to be a major part of kind of party politics um, moving forward. But actually, when you look at the polls, what you see is environment kind of dropping off as an issue, dropping off as an age divided issue as well. And that's not because um, older voters are suddenly starting to kind of focus more on the environment, which is maybe what we would hope for. It's because the younger voters have kind of stopped prioritizing it as one of their top issues. I mean, OK, yes, the economy is in a really, really bad place and that might be what's driving this. You know, you maybe are less kind of focused on 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 those issues at the moment. Um, but I think it is, um, you know, something that we is, is very interesting, both in terms of an issue that could be very age divided, that's just like not playing um, a bigger role as we might have expected. Um, on the public services point, um, I just wanted to mention some previous research that we did with um, uh, Nuffield College, and they looked at um, what different age groups um, uh, were prioritising in terms of kind of spending patterns and, and the things that they think um, the government should be spending more money on. And they find um, quite a lot of um, kind of consistency across age groups. There are there are differences. There are some differences on on some issues which you would, exp you know, you would characterise as spending for a specific generation, education or um, uh, like yeah, vocational education or house, house building. Um, Lara mentioned house building could be uh, quite a key political issue um, in this gener in in this election with Labour kind of making big commitments on it. But what one of their findings um, is that when you have an older generation who has um, younger generate uh, younger family members who are financially struggling they become suddenly more likely to vote in a certain way. Um, and in particular, two of the things that they become more likely to prioritise is um, vocational education courses and also local house building in their area. Um, and so, um, you know, putting house building at the centre of, of, of this debate, if that's something that Labour um, is successful in doing, could actually be persuading not just the, um, the, the young voters who, who want to get on the housing ladder, um, but also their parents. Yeah. Thank you. And just on this sort of divide question, I, I would add one other factor in terms of sort of political behaviour, uh, which is the size of different cohorts. If the birth, if the number of babies born was the same every year, the dynamics would be different. And in a way, the question at the back of my book on all this was, if you had a choice to choose to be either in a big cohort, lots of other people your age, or in a small cohort, not many people your age, the classic answer was always, obviously, better be in a small cohort, you know, go through life, business class, not economy class, more space, less competition for jobs, less competition for housing. But in reality, and politics is a 
example of this. It looks like the way it plays out in modern market economies and democracies is being in a big cohort works well for you because it means markets oriented around your choices and politicians particularly care about your age group because if there's a lot of you. So the, so the size of the different birth cohorts becomes a relevant political factor. Once you start thinking for various reasons, including people being having their political views particularly imprinted by their experiences, it looks, if you, if you ask people what's the most significant political event that's happened during your life, they have a high propensity to refer to something that happened when they were between the ages of about 16 and 25. So there is a bit of kind of political imprinting. So if there's a lot of people in those cohorts, they, they particularly matter to politicians. So that's another... That's why I wanted to start with this. That's why there are all those, all those 60 year olds. There were a hell of a lot of people born in 1964 and politicians spot that kind of thing. Um, I think we should, there's another question which is, has come up online and is also one of our polling questions that I just want to put up. And, and this is about um, how we encourage people to vote and I'm going to put up a, you see, is the, and, is, and it does look, and of course Sophie does cover this very effectively in the paper, as if there are issues around propensity to vote and to what extent is these people registering. And we have a poll question on this as well, which I'm going to invite people to vote on, if we can move. Yes, here we are. So this is... Um, I'm going to mean, and we, they're going to have to do this quick because I want to focus on this as the next round of questioning. And we'll start with Sophie. But if you want people, if you were trying to encourage people to vote, it'd be interesting to know which of these answers you would give as your preferred lever. So, is there an issue about propensity to vote? How much does it matter? I don't think we can do about it. Which is one of the themes in the paper. Sophie, do you want to do you want to start off on this while people still decide how they're going to vote on our particular questionnaire? Yeah, so I mean, there is a clear um, trend with tenure. We, you know, we see a much higher propensity to vote if you are uh, an owner occupier or a mortgager. I mean, you're more likely to be in your house for longer. You're less likely to kind of fall off the electoral register and to be registered at the address that you live. And so we do see much higher kind of um, voter registration amongst those groups. And that was clearly driving um, part of why we were seeing youth turnout falling. I don't think it can explain why we're seeing this divergence in young in in the education and in the um, home ownership gaps uh, since 2019 um, in terms of what people say that they're going to be doing in terms of their voting intentions. Um, I think um, uh, even when we look at just homeowners and we compare graduates and non-graduates, the propensity to vote is much higher um, for. Uh, um, graduate homeowners than it is for non-graduate homeowners and so it's not just a tenure issue although tenure is incredibly important um, I think one thing I mean for me if I was answering this poll am I allowed to answer the poll uh, yeah yes yeah. go for it go for um, so I think what that suggests <laughs> is that uh, making it easier to register um, is is really important but it's probably not the be all and end all because um, the the thing that we're saying tenure which has been a major kind of contributing to how easy it is to kind of stay registered at least um, is maybe not making such a big change um, uh, the more youth faced policy priorities uh, you, you know I think that kind of naturally comes after like it's a bit of a vicious circle you're not going to get it until you kind of get higher youth turnout to some extent um, but that kind of final um, the final point around uh, electoral reform I mean often the way that people think about like they, they might be thinking this is kind of um, proportional representation but for me it's the kind of Australia model you know um, and this kind of comes on the civic duty to vote the kind of compulsory voting model I mean if you look at Australia they were really really yeah. concerned because their voter turnout fell below 90% in the last election um, and, um, you know, for us, that would be a kind of 20, 20 percentage point increase in turnout concentrated amongst younger voters. Very good. Now, can we, Emma, can we now see the result of this poll and then uh, Lara might want to comment on it? Interesting there. Electoral reform running ahead is the most likely to encourage them. Uh, registration doing surprisingly badly. And it's good that the total nihilists who think nothing can be done are scoring 0%. We like the fact we have optimistic, engaged participants. Nobody thinks nothing can be done. That's fantastic. 
What's your, what Can do I you think ask, of this whole do, issue? Do young people in polls say that electoral reform is a salient issue for them or it would make them more likely to vote? Do we know that? I guess it depends what... Well, I mean, electoral reform is quite a broad... Oh, yeah. mm. We were um, trying to think... I, I think there was a specific thought behind it which followed on from some of James's analysis. There is an argument, and he's the expert, but there is an argument that because of this geography that he was describing before, one of Labour's problems is the young people's vote is piling up in areas where they are all concentrated anyway, so it's slightly wasted in delivering the very large majorities amongst concentrations of young people. And if it were PR, there would be a stronger motivation for people in those circumstances to vote. I think that is one possible thought behind this. But you, you, well, before we ask another question to James, you, you still... Yeah, <laughs> um, apart from nothing can be done, I'm, I'm picking the second least popular option. I just think making it easier... Uh, not necessarily to vote, but certainly to register. I cannot see the logic for not at least considering more seriously things around auto-enrolment. There are so many things you can do to make it easier to get young people especially to register. Um, to me, the political case for getting them registered is just inarguable, um, and there's plenty that lots of organisations, schools included, could do. So I just think that, aside any of the wider political questions, is, a, is an obvious thank thing that people I, should Thank do. you very much. And although Sophie is right that in terms of trends and moves between elections, it may not be massive. The fact is, if you're in pri the private rented sector you're, and right. you're moving around, your chances of being on the register are significantly lower mm -hmm. than if it's own occupation. And that can't be a good thing in a, yeah. in a democracy. Yeah. So thank you so much for making that point, Lara. Uh, James, your observations? It's a bit of the Pandora's box, electoral reform, for the last nine minutes of the channel. <laughs> um, you don't really agree with our voters, do you? Uh, <laughs> no, I think broadly, um, electoral reform would probably lead to a rise in, in, in turnout, uh, at least initially. Um, but it doesn't necessarily produce the kind of progressive results that people intend on doing. Right? I, as a pollster, I work across, across the world and you know, there's, not, there's not really a link. There's not much of a link between uh, the system that you have and the outcomes that you get. Um, although there is some evidence from New Zealand, there was an academic paper and actually after they introduced PR, they tended to be more Labour-led uh, coalitions. But on the, on the electoral reform thing, yes, young people are stacked in, in, in cities. Their vote is very inefficient and it's distributed very asymmetrically. Um, but our turnout was such, I think it was 72% in 2017. It went slightly down, I think, to 69% or so in 2019 after 2017. And one of the things is the huge groups of people who really don't vote are actually very politically divided. Um, and actually are swing voters. They tend to be much more working class, tend to live in exurbs or suburbs, and tend to be swing voters between Labour and the Conservatives. And actually, if we had electoral reform, the one thing I do think that would happen is the Liberal Democrat vote would go down uh, enormously um, because they're, they, they play much less in that part of the quadrant uh, in, in, in terms of politics. And so actually, we don't really know what the political consequences of it are. I think in terms of vote share changes, I can't imagine it would be uh, as different as people imagine. I imagine that the Green Party and the Reform Party would probably be uh, higher up because one of the things you see between electoral cycles is that Reform or their ancestor parties or Greens tend to be poll quite high and then they contract as you get to an election, which is a reflection of the political system. So I imagine they would be um, materially bigger, but the Liberal Democrats would probably be smaller. Um, and the question, I guess, in Scotland, it's interesting, right? Nationalist parties would have far less of an effect because they'd be proportionately much smaller. So there's all sorts of interesting stuff. But I, I've, you know, I've worked in Australia and on Australian elections. And one of the really interesting things about having compulsory turnout, which is not really compulsory, you get fined $100, I think, uh, but turnout is between 90 and 92%. Is it, that, you know, there's strong arguments that actually that benefits the right in Australia uh, in terms of, so, there's lots of good arguments for it. There's lots of good arguments against it. I think just generally with big existential change, it never produces the thing that quite that you intend it on doing. Very interesting. Now let's give an opportunity to the people physically here again with some more interventions. Uh, yes, let's take the lady there and then we we'll go over there. Yeah. Hi, I'm Jo Evans, fellow pollster at Whitestone Insight. Um, just anecdotally, I've heard... Um, young people say that um, they're not going to vote as kind of a protest vote. Um, they're not satisfied with any of the options in front of them, so therefore they're not going to vote. 
I'm just interested, what do you think is the most um, effective thing a person could do if they're not satisfied with the political options in front of them? Ah, oh, that's a very good question. Um, then the question over there. Um, Piers Williamson from the Housing Finance Corporation. My perception of um, the, the, the uh, I, I suppose, the urban, non-urban divide is, is that big conurbations are labor strongholds and more rural areas are conservative strongholds. Th this election presumably is going to get won, on, won or lost on 60 or 80 marginal seats. I wondered in those marginal seats, wh where are those marginal seats where this age divide is most critical? Thank you. And I think there's a question here in the front row. Gentlemen here, yeah, yeah. Let's take a third one. Um, thank you. Um, in view of the crescendo of warnings in the last year or two about climate change, right. I'm surprised that Green Party support hasn't risen particularly among the young who will live long enough to uh, be impacted by the effects. I wondered if you could comment on that. Yes, thank you. And indeed, that neatly matches a question that um, we had online as well about attitudes to the causes of climate change and um, whether that varies by age. So that reinforces your question, sir. Um, let's... Uh, why don't we start with you, Laura? <laughs> I mean, those are very difficult questions. Um, to the, I think, most difficult one, which is what can you say to somebody mm. about having uh, impact? I genuinely still think joining a political party probably represents some big opportunities for influencing politics. Um, there may well be a Conservative leadership election in the next year, for example. The electorate is, compared to the wider electorate in the country, a pretty small one. Um, if you feel like influencing the policies of the Conservative Party, if you're interested in the Conservative Party, you can imagine that is a, um, is a, is a pretty fertile ground for having some political influence, but to many young people, they won't want to, to do that. And it is, it is a, a very, very difficult question um, to answer. And to the question about the environment, I think what Sophie mm. said was, was fascinating around it being a less salient issue even among young people come the next election and the fact that when it comes to immediate concerns that people have with the economy um, that we are going to have to make in the next election that actually that does crowd out issues like climate change which people still think even you know rightly or wrongly have a longer term um, frame. Yeah. Sophie? Yeah I mean on the on the environment point I mean we ever talked about what's happened in the environmental polling so I guess it's not a surprise to see um, the Green Party not um, uh, picking up the vote in response to that. Um, I would say, you know, I mean, it's obviously incredibly important that we find a way to kind of um, allow there to continue being momentum on like net zero and environmental policies, um, even when there are kind of dips in an, in the economy, because uh, you need that kind of continuous policy for us to get to the kind of eventual net zero goals that we have um, and, that, and make those important transition decisions. Um, on the kind of marginal seats and the seats that change, we, we did have a chart um, in in there where we compared um, what had happened between um, uh, in the last election, basically, in terms of the age, average age of seats that were conservative um, majorities, Labour majorities, and sort of the marginal seats. And the marginal seats are in the middle somewhere, so the conservative seats are the oldest, the um, Labour seats are the youngest, um, and the gap between the conservative and Labour um, seats increased in 2019. I mean, as we've been talking about, the age divide has kind of uh, uh, been getting worse. And But part of what was driving that was these uh, younger Labour seats moving into um, sort of marginal or conservative um, uh, majorities. And so it's those ones that will probably kind of be those kind of key... Uh, swing votes kind of that might that might come back um, now that they're doing a bit better um, and on the final point around yeah what young people should do I mean, that's a it's a, a difficult question but I would say like at the very least turning up and spoiling your ballot paper says that you're bothered to you are putting in the effort to vote um, and might make you might make politicians um, think about you more seriously than if you're not turning up at all. Yeah. James? Which one? Because there are a lot of questions. <laughs> um, well, I think that there was... Well, you had three questions. One is for the people who really were not um, attracted by any particular assembly of a political programme. But if, if you want... We haven't really touched on the urban-rural question, so you might want to comment on that. 
Uh, and if you have observations, I'm going to decline. But that's been covered by the other okay. two panellists. Yeah, I'll, I'll cover the, den the, the urban rural uh, question. So, yeah, the political map of the UK and the US uh, represent basically a, a density map, an ONS map. If you, look at a, if you get a geographic map and you swap the colours, they're quite similar, which is that basically... Um, you know, it's most visible in university towns. Let's take, say, Cambridge or Oxford. The centre is red, the outer conurbation is yellow, and the rural bit around it is, it looks like a dartboard, and the bit around it is blue. Uh, and that's primarily because that basically relates to the average age of the area, but also the level of number of graduates. And so centre-right parties, or the Conservative Party, when it says watermark, tends to just hit the edges of cities or win over smaller cities. Uh, and when the Labour Party has a high watermark, it tends to go quite far into the countryside and into rural areas. Um, and there is a slight geographic tilt to that. So in general, when Labour at their high watermark, yes, they win over countryside, but in general, it tends to be countryside um, above the kind of East Midlands, all the way up to the northeast. And when the Conservatives are at their high watermark, they tend to win over small cities and towns that are actually not uh, necessarily in the south, but actually more in the East Mids and West Mids and the northwest, so like Blackpool, Walsall's, West Bromwich. That, so that, does that kind of put, so the swing seats are very disproportionately uh, areas that are neither city nor countryside, like constituencies can be very synthetic, particularly after the boundary changes, and very often you get like a small tiny bit of a city and then a massive bit of countryside and that, on an average basis, that looks, you know, people would say that's suburban, it's not really, but those are disproportionately the seats that determine who is Prime Minister. Thank you very much. Um, I'm now going to have uh, one uh, final set of the online questions. And um, there are several uh, rather diverse questions. The one that's been upvoted a lot is about uh, religion and to what extent that is a divide, um, and particularly, um, I guess, the impact of conflict in Israel and the Gaza Strip. So be interested to know if, I guess this may be James in particular, has an observation on that. There's a, another line of questioning that has been picked up by several people. And uh, this, I think, could be Stefan Cern of the FT. The, the, um, have, um, this is whether older boomers are racked with guilt or not about what they've done. And uh, so should, uh, do they, to what extent do they understand how much life has t changed for, in different ways for younger people? And um, there was a, and there was a related question, which is also gets to an, another range of tricky issues about the uh, voting between the well-off and the less well-off. So maybe you would, uh, uh, that, why don't you comment on those, that last round of online questions, and then if there's time, I'll try to squeeze in the last one or two people here in the room. But, um, and James, do you want to start that, um, especially that issue about religious, the, the religious uh, dimension, which we didn't cover in our review. Mm. Yeah, I don't, I don't really fancy answering this, but I will. Um, so I'm in May this year, I'll be producing with a, uh, on Fridays, I work at King's College London as a senior researcher in politics. And we're actually doing a paper on, I think it's the largest ever survey of non-white citizens of the last 15 years. And we have probably the largest sample of, of, of Muslim voters and Hindu voters across lots of different religions. And it is quite interesting. And it was done before um, the situation in Israel and Gaza. Um, so I'd say three things, really. First of all, there's been a survey poll recently done, uh, which was a probabilistic phone-based survey that has shown a, a material fall in the vote share uh, for Labour amongst the Muslim community. As to the political consequences of that, um, it is capped by the distribution of where Muslims live uh, and the fact that they're not evenly spread around the country and therefore it is, it is it's likely to have a very limited electoral impact. Um, Nonetheless, um, it's being, the situation is being exploited by people like George Galloway, uh, which, who is likely to return to the fray, uh, and that's never a, a positive thing. Uh, and I think that could well um, be a bit of a postscript to that. But I think there's a, you know, foreign policy matters do ma matter to minority communities. 
and to people of specific re religions. So one of the things that our research showed is that like the Hindu vote went conservative for the first time ever in 2019, but the other groups actually went more to the left. Um, and actually the, the, what parties have to say about different foreign policy issues does matter for certain minority communities. This is the case in the UK. It's also the case across other English speaking countries. Uh, Australia had a referendum on the voice and that was a very, that was very, uh, and we polled that and MRP'd it, and it was very crit really critical what different parties' foreign policies were. So this is just like the future of multicultural, multi-faith Western societies. This stuff does matter, whether you like that or not, it's beside the point, it does matter. Um, and so, yeah, it's very hard to see the long-term consequences of, of what's happening right now. It's like, you know, this is a 20-year story, not a panel, uh, a one-off. Uh, comment on a panel, but I think it does matter, but I don't think we know yet what the long-term consequences are going to be. On the, I won't answer all three, uh, on the, there were two other questions. They're all quite tricky, they're getting trickier now. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's, there's, um, uh, let's, there's that one, which is, they're, they're both about kind of material circumstances, really. Stefan. Um, yeah, there's, there's, this is okay. how the deal has changed. And related to that, is this really about wealth and income? Uh, and is that the real driver? And it's just so happens that wealth and income now vary so much by age that age is picking up an underlying wealth and income issue, I guess, would be another interpretation of the other question. Yeah. I think there was an interesting article about who wants to be a millionaire last week. I don't know who saw it. Something like if you, you had to get eight questions right to get a house deposit when it was first started and now it's 14 or something. Um, <laughs> it was, uh, I thought it was a really funny and interesting way of describing the differing economics of different generations. Um, income though is not the main divider. Um, once you adjust for levels of education, geography, um, uh, housing tenure, marital status, income, where your income comes from, matters more as opposed to the level of income. So for example, being public sector versus private sector is a big marker. So across the country, there are many wealthy areas that uh, do vote Labour, have voted Labour and will continue to do so. And they disproportionately have public sector wealth. Mm. Uh, and the same is true of the uh, richer areas that uh, look have match on an income level, but they tend to be more private sector based. And that's even exacerbated as you look at the types of jobs that people do and the number of graduates in them. Um, so I think, yeah, it's a, it's a great point, Stefan, but, but unfortunately with most of British politics, the answer is it's complicated. <laughs> but it, it also, <coughs> isn't it also the case that when he said, do, do boomers understand the circumstances of, for their, perhaps their kids or grandkids, one of the things that happens is boomers project onto the younger generation assumptions about well they're spending all their money on eating out or they're spending all their money on travel and if they only didn't if they didn't do that they could save up to put down the deposit there's those kind of um, projections to try to explain how this has happened which are often unrealistic as we've shown in our own research at revolution mm. they're unfair and inaccurate caricatures and it isn't the avocado toast that's really the, re that's the reason why <laughs> you can't afford a house. And I think that's maybe partly what Stephanie is trying to get to, how much mutual understanding there is about the different circumstances. Different. I mean, I don't know if you have any observations on that. I mean, I, uh, this is not a scientific observation, but um, the Times often publishes pieces on the deal that young people face, often comment pieces as well. Uh, and very often you read between the line, be below the line comments from people who are clearly of the Gen X and Boomer generation saying, this is really desperate and I really feel for my own children and grandchildren in this matter and I'm frustrated that more hasn't been done to do X, Y, Z. Um, and actually I think the polling that we've seen bears that out, that there isn't this sense of intergenerational tension on account of this. Uh, and perhaps that is because there is a recognition in some way of, of this deal. I mean, I still think, I, I would say actually one of the more interesting things in my personal experience has been speaking to other young people who are set to be the beneficiaries of massive passive asset gains of their parents yes. and grandparents who themselves aren't really aware of just how fundamental yes. that is as well. And I think that that's quite interesting, if not particularly yes. consequential. Yes. And it, it may be, we've got to disentangle this, it may be that the wealth effect is even more significant than the income effect and the, and the, the significance of, and the gap, the rise in the significance of wealth. Um, both Torsten and I think perhaps the most important indicator of political economy in Britain has been the rise in the ratio of, 
assets to GDP rising from three times, wealth used to be three times GDP, uh, it's probably past its peak, but it peaked probably about eight times GDP and maybe now about seven times GDP. So this is a world where wealth matters more and, you, and acquiring wealth out of your income is harder and, and wealth is a bigger deal. And so inheritance becomes more important. So your family becomes more important. There's a whole host of consequences, and I think it is a great yeah. political. I thing. think I remember reading in Bobby Duffy's book about generations. One of the interesting statistics he had is the rising age in which you are likely to inherit from your parents or yep. grandparents, and that having gone up to sixty or so, yep. which is far too late to be able to use that yes. if you're a young person to accrue certain yep. opportunities. Right. So I think mm. that's another interesting. Yeah, he was citing a piece of resolution research. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yes, 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 just um, no point. But yes, yes, making that. Um, Sorry. And no, that's all right. No, it's fine. It's good to have the opportunity to make that. <laughs> uh, Sophie, anything you want to say on this? Um, yeah, I mean, of course, it's not going to help, uh, just to add to your point, it's not going to help young people get on the housing ladder, but it could be really fundamental in the kind of quality of li life um, that younger generations have in retirement. And if they start thinking about it in a kind of more practical way, the decisions that they make in terms of pensions and the way that you save up um, and like the saving dynamics. So I think there's some really interesting and unanswered questions about how that kind of um, differential role um, plays out. I think just finally on the point, do they understand the deal? I think there's signs that they're maybe like starting to understand a bit more. Like as you say, maybe some more of these comments about how bad of the deal the younger people have got. And I think a lot of the research which is pointing to the really important role that the bank of mum and dad is starting to play and we're starting to see um, youth home and ship rates start to tick up. And really that can't be because of incomes and, and it's definitely not because of falling house prices. I mean, maybe a little bit this year, but this is kind of predating um, the last year's um, house price fall. So there's a strong indication that this is uh, parents starting to realise that the only way their kids are going to get that is by getting on the housing ladder. Obviously not great from a social mobility perspective, but from a kind of older generation starting to realise that the deal hasn't been that fair, maybe that is a sign that it's happened. Indeed. And I think there was one, we're going to take one quick intervention uh, here, and then I'm going to be with the panellists final opportunity to uh, give one comment. Good morning. Ian Sheridan, a lawyer. Um, thank you. Very interesting observations. My, my question concerns what can the media do to clarify what each party intends? So by which I mean, if you look at the manifestos, they're not short documents. I'm sure good journalists can summarise them. But what, what can be done to crystallise what each party says they will do and um, what they've actually done in the past. Right, okay. James, do you want to come to that? And any final observation <laughs> you have on the wider debate? Okay. Um, really going outside my uh, professional uh, pen here. Um, so your question is basically how, how can the media translate what, is, what are manifesto commitments and articulate those to people uh, so that they can understand? I mean, the first thing I imagine is... is um, is a kind of fair and kind of synthesis of what the parties do. I think, for example, the BBC does a pretty good job every time parties launch manifestos of saying, here is what they're doing, here's what their priorities are, here's what they are. There are plenty of like public service websites that offer fairly clear information about what each party intends on doing and, and what it... And your question, though, is about how can they flag when they intend on doing something and then, then don't do it, which is the harder piece. And I think there it's about... Um, more public service broadcasting of saying they've achieved X, they've not done Y, they've achieved Z. But I don't think it's it's worth not overestimating that as like a cause of a kind of political malaise or, or, or division. If you look at the polling, that specific thing very rarely comes up, a bit like electoral reform actually comes up a lot less than you, you might think as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Laura, your final observation, and also, and particularly on this thing, how do you think the Times and in Red Box you will be covering generational issues and how it plays into politics? Yeah, I mean, I think our readers are very interested in generational issues and how it plays into politics as just the wider questions of changes in voting patterns. I think uh, I'm lucky with Redbox because it tends to be people that are very enthusiastic already about politics, whereas obviously yeah. what we're talking about in some sense today is trying to get people interested in politics. I don't 
feel that I have that barrier often with some of the readers because people have, I mean, I've, you know, you find if you get one tiny thing wrong, you, you get many, many emails from people who know, know about these things in great detail and that, that's a privilege. But I'm, you know, I think one of the uh, big things in the next election, obviously a big challenge that you have is, is distilling those manifesto commitments and, and my ignorance, are you allowed to stray onto TikTok with a, a, a smaller version? <laughs> it's a very good question. Um, I think, yeah, I think that would, that would be a big thing for, um, for the media in general is how do we use different social media platforms come the next election. Yeah. Non -voting the, the disenfranchised, you can see yeah. where they might pick up on it. Yeah. Yeah. That rather than on yeah. I think that's certainly. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Uh, yeah, I think that's certainly something that we've seen yeah. is, is the increased importance in social media for parties and for the media in political communication and, and journalism, yeah. And finally, we're running out of time. Sophie, a final observation. Uh, Brilliant research from just on that Cameron point. at Res. Anything uh, you want to say to enlighten the nation? Well, just on yeah, on what media can do, it can cover all of Resolution Foundation's fantastic <laughs> electric coverage <laughs> explainers that will be coming out this year. Um, so there you go, the selfish That's, plug. <laughs> that is a great answer. Thank you very much to our panellists. It's very good of James and Lara to have joined us. Thank you to Sophie and Cameron for producing this excellent report. Thank you all for coming on both physically and also online. Enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you very much. <laughs>